I mean, I've worked on some real junk, but this one takes the cake. Pirate, ghost, and robots. I mean, what do they think? We're idiots? Yes. Pirate, ghost, robots. How stupid. Ratchet and Clank would never do that. Thank you so much for your splendid support on my long ass Jack 3 review. As always, leave a comment to be featured in my next video, and I'd like to extend my special gratitude to my patrons, Dauber underscore, Stin, Dano, Dotman, Jesse, Brian, and Angel. With that said, I hope you enjoy Ratchet 3. With the astronomical success, pun entirely intended, of the first two entries in the series, Ratchet and Clank had become the new faces of PlayStation. When it was time for Ratchet 3, though, in Insomniac thought they had tarnished their image and created their first failure. I remember going out to lunch with the designers and all of us just like, we're, you know, we're, we're putting like, uh, earthquake blankets over each other and try, you know, trying not to cry. And, uh, I think Colin said, I'm really worried that we will make Insomniac's first failure. But this would technically be their second since Spyro 3 exists. <laughs> Turns out what they created would actually be the exact opposite. And then, like two weeks later, it was the highest rated game Insomniac's ever made. Wrong! Everybody else's opinion is irrelevant, it's all about what I think, and well, they're off to a good start with another banger of a home screen. Yep, I believe it, best game they've ever made. Good work, boys. Things kick off back at Ratchet and Clank's apartment in the Bogon Galaxy as Clank tunes in to watch himself on TV because now he has become a television superstar known as Secret Agent Clank, and Ratchet is his chauffeur. It's funny how once again the roles have reversed as Clank started off as the no-nonsense hero wanting to protect the universe, who's gradually taken up more of an interest in chilling out or doing fun things like becoming a hit TV star. Whereas Ratchet now, like in Going Commando, has prioritized being a hero where before he'd rather slack off. July Resort, Pokitaru. I knew it. Or become the next Skid McMarks. It's funny how time changes a man. Hey, Ratchet, what's up? Hi, Skid. You can tell the two have really rubbed off on each other over the years, now having found a balance for heroism rather than being a hard ass or a complete slacker. Embarrassed from being portrayed as Clank's lackey, Ratchet changes the channel over to the news to see his home planet of Veldon back in the Solana Galaxy under assault of the Tyranoids, an attack allegedly coordinated by robotic supervillain Dr. Nefarious. No, not that one, or that one. Ugh. Shit still creeps me out. And the duo quickly race to protect the planet. As soon as we get there, I switch off the helipack for the jetpack because the jetpack is so much better and if you don't think so, you're wrong. Once that absolutely necessary task is taken care of, we then meet up with the Galactic Rangers, a space police force who are terrible at their job and make us do everything. They give us some guns because for some reason Ratchet decided not to bring any of his own and Gadgetron has definitely stepped up their game since... Well, the first game. The Chad Megacorp introduced us to kick-ass upgradable weapons back in Bogon, but Gadgetron said screw just one upgrade, because now you can up your arsenal, not twice, not three, but four times, all the way up to level five. And that's not even including challenge mode, where you can purchase mega weapons, upgrade them to giga weapons, and then omega weapons. Not only do the weapons increase in power, which you can now actually statistically compare how strong your weapons are, they of course increase in ammo capacity, but as they continue to upgrade, they also can receive receive lock-on mods, shock mods, and more. That's right, no more platinum bolts being used to purchase the upgrades through Slim Cognito, which, by the way, first they were gold, then platinum, now titanium. Make up your fucking mind. Now titanium bolts are used to purchase skins, which is pretty fun, but good news our boy Slim does still stick around to sneak us some of the best weapons from the Megacorp arsenal for free. No 10% discount like some of the Gadgetron weapons if you beat Ratchet 1. If you beat Ratchet 2, you get the Shield Charger, the Bouncer, the Plasma Storm, and more for free. What? But before you potentially decide to waste your money on some other gun, you can now test out the weapons before you buy them in a VR facility. Thank God, now I know how much this thing sucks as well as this one. Get it? Cuz... It literally sucks. We already know Megacorp weapons are amazing, but Gadgetron doesn't have any slackers here either, such as the Spitting Hydra, which can target multiple opponents at once before blasting them away, the Flux Rifle, which is just a standard sniper, the Annihilator, which is like if the mini rocket tube and the bouncer did the fusion dance, is after the rocket detonates, small bombs will scatter across the ground, and when it's fully upgraded, it creates smaller homing rockets, and you can't forget about the multi-disc gun, which ricochets off enemies and walls while also splitting into even smaller, also ricocheting blades. And while this is a mega Corp gun, I do have to bring up the lava gun, which rather than becoming the meteor gun like before, this time it becomes the liquid nitrogen gun, which now freezes enemies. It's so good.
You thought I was gonna say cool, didn't you? The gunplay and gameplay in general is made much more efficient now, as you can swap through your recently used weapons and gadgets by tapping triangle. You also now have two quick select rings. Rather than having to manually buy ammo for each individual weapon, you can now max out all at once. The swing shot equips by itself whenever the situation calls for it. I mean, everything is just much more efficient and refined now, as if they didn't do enough of that last time. While Ratchet 3 taking the time to focus even more on the gunplay has been really fun, there is some stuff that I was sad to see go. For one thing, I'm probably one of nine people in the world who were disappointed not to find any space dogfights here. They were a nice visual treat and a good pace breaker, and for a series whose whole premise is based on hopping from planet to planet across galaxies, it just makes sense to be a thing. You can still make changes to your ship though with bolts, even if the changes are completely cosmetic now. And yes, no more raritanium either. Speaking of cosmetics, Ratchet 3's levels are by a good bit the most uninteresting visually from the trilogy for me. Now for Ratchet and Clank standards, it's still very interesting, but but unlike many of the levels in Going Commando and Ratchet 1, I never found myself really stopping to just look at them and take in the gorgeous set pieces. There's a few highlights here which I'll get to, but nothing like Smolg, Grelbin, Snivelak, the Gemlik Moon Base, etc. I mean, Metropolis, Iridia, and Blackwater City all return here, but they're much less captivating compared to their original incarnations. But you know, I guess that makes sense. Of course, the battlefield's gonna look like shit. Laron is pretty cool. Aquados is beautiful for like five seconds. The Obani moons are stunning. The Zeldrin starport just gives me big Spyro vibes for whatever reason, I think because of the music, but yeah, that's nice. But then there's places like Hollow Star Studios, which are, I mean, just look at how bland this place looks. That's not something I've ever said about a Ratchet and Clank level before. You get to go on the set of Secret Agent Clank from the opening cutscene, but that's the only cool thing about this place, really. It's so lifeless, and as a whole, there's so many levels that utilize the same red, orange, brown color scheme and it just gets dull. Not to mention there's hardly any new ways to explore anymore. Nearly every level is just take point A to point B with the exception of Dax? I didn't mention it earlier, but it's another level that really stands out to me because it's like one of three levels that actually has branching paths like previous games. In Ratchet 1, you've got Navalis with three, technically four different paths to take. Iridia had three, the Blarg Station had three, and countless other planets followed this formula. In Ratchet 2, Uzla had two paths to take, and Dako had three, Damazel had three. Along these routes, you can find cool optional gadgets, items, weapons, interact with new characters to progress the story, which... Where the hell are they? I guess with this big galactic war going on, their absence makes sense. Maybe everyone evacuated already? The galaxy probably learned a lot from the whole Drek debacle. And remember how some pathways used to lead to grind rail sections? None of them now either. Racing? Nope. <laughs> The biggest bit of variety we get from blowing shit up is blowing shit up, but with these turds mandatorily. And we have to sometimes use turrets and hovercrafts, which are okay, I guess. Not to mention the missions get quite repetitive. Sometimes you have to clear an area only to have to clear it again, but this time you have to turn on your defenses. Like, why couldn't this just be one mission? To ease the pain, you do get paid to do these missions, but if I wanted to blow up a bunch of people for money, I would rather choose to go to Annihilation Nation, the one-stop gladiator arena rather than two of them them like before. Annihilation Nation also has even more challenges than the previous arenas, like automatically cycling weapons, sleeping gas rounds, not that this is a challenge, but sometimes this turret pops up and decides to wreck shit. It's more fun than ever, and a great place to rack up some quick bolts and bolster your firepower fast, but no more cage matches, which is a bit sad. Speaking of sad, my god, these arena bosses are pathetic. Good lord! Where Ratchet 3 is no slouch though, is the music, which is fucking bumping! I haven't done this in a while, but you need to. You just need to hear some samples from this fucking soundtrack. Oh my god, that 
is the best soundtrack I've ever tasted. Now, while there aren't as many deviations from the standard gameplay here, there is one addition to the formula here that I really love. The Quark historically accurate interactive graphic novels, or as some idiots call them, vid comics. These are the real life adventures of Captain Quark, the greatest superhero the galaxy has ever known. Hey, this thing on? <clears throat> Meticulously reconstructed by our crack research team with the aid of eyewitness accounts, bathroom gossip, wild speculation, and a magic eight ball. They're pretty fun to play, and they're also hilarious. The Quark historically accurate interactive graphic novels aren't the only funny part of the game. Nearly every cutscene is must-see stuff. My daughter tells me you're a man who's good with his hands, Ratchet. Sir, I, I swear I never- The city's laser sh- Citizens of the Solana Galaxy owed their lives to the dauntless courage of the remarkable man behind the queue. With great reluctance, Quark accepted a meager fee for his services and promptly donated the entire sum to the Quark for Tots Scholarship Fund, a charity providing makeovers and buxom bimbos for needy people named Quark. I've got a big heart. I could obliterate the lot of you, and they wouldn't even mention it in Supervillain Weekly. True, sir, but you'd have done the fashion world an enormous service. Ratchet 1 and 2 were already really funny, but 3 is just a cut above the rest in my opinion. What is not a cut above the rest, however, like the arena bosses, are the rest of the bosses. In the majority of cases, they're even easier in this game. Nothing so dreadfully painful as a snivelack mech, thank you lord, but everything is so so easy this time around it's not even funny. You know what this means, kids, before I break them down? It's story time with Mr. Jawhead game reviews. Once we clear out the waves of the Tyranoid Menace with the help of the Galactic Rangers, we receive a transmission from the Solana Galaxy President, leaving Ratchet to feel neglected yet again as he offers Secret Agent Clank a special greeting, but refers to Ratchet as the chauffeur. El Presidente explains that only one man has ever faced Nefarious and survived, and he has just received a report of this man's whereabouts. I've seen him run right through our camping site. He was buck naked, screaming and holding up a banana. Or, or maybe it weren't a banana. It, it could be one of nature's mysteries. So the duo head off for the Florana jungle, where there's actually the debut of a couple new crates. There's a bolt multiplier crate, which temporarily increases the amount of bolts you'll gain. And then there's the Inferno power crate, which spawn this invincible armor for Ratchet, as well as igniting himself and granting him dual flaming wrenches for a limited time. <laughs> It's a pretty random power-up, but I dig it. You can also discover your first trophy on this planet, which is a new line of collectibles for the series. Once all trophies in the game are found, you are granted access to a teleporter taking you to the Insomniac Museum, or you can access it by using this pad later on in the game at 3 a.m. At the end of the Florana jungle, they find the mysterious man, and he sends them through his path of death, and the man turns out to be none other than Captain Quark. We kick his ass quite easily, and it seems Quark has lost his memory, so with the help of the president's daughter Sasha, we bring Quark back to the Starship Phoenix, which is basically the hub area for the rest of the game where you can play the historically accurate interactive graphic novels, test your weapons, buy armor, which I did not do again because I am a boss, and more. <laughs> After arriving on the ship, we go to talk to Sasha, who's on a call with her dad, and the signal is interrupted with the legendary debut of Dr. Nefarious and his butler, Lawrence. So here's the thing about Dr. Nefarious. There's no denying that he, along with Lawrence, are some of the most entertaining characters I have ever seen in in any form of media. For as much as I love this guy to death though, his motives are fucking stupid. So his whole deal is that he wants to turn the galaxy into robots because he feels that robots are oppressed and not treated with the same standards as organic life forms. If you wanted to highlight this notion in Ratchet 1 or 2, I'd still be like, eh, but whatever. Here, it's just especially dumb because Clank is literally a beloved TV superstar and Ratchet, the organic life form is the one stuck with the running gag of being neglected and ignored. It makes no sense, and even outside of this, there's just never really been a time I can recall robots being really discriminated against in the series before this. They've always been equals. Although Nefarious may be more entertaining than Drek, Drek was a way better villain. There was never a point where I took Nefarious all that seriously except for one time. Drek felt like a legitimate, diabolical threat 
that needed to be stopped, and on top of that, had logical motives. Again, from an entertainment standpoint, I love Nefarious, but as a villain, his motives are pretty lame. After playing the first historically accurate- Alright, I'm done. Quark's memory is restored. Quark then assembles the Q-Force consisting of Al for his mastery of electronics, Skid McMarks for his nerves of steel, hey! Helga for her sensual powers of seduction, <laughs> Quark's monkey scrunch, Ratchet, Clank, and Sasha, and lays out a plan to infiltrate Nefarious's underwater base on Aquados. Ratchet and Clank will descend to the sea floor and wade through a series of tunnels flooded with waist-high raw sewage. What? Please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. When they reach Nefarious's office, it turns out that he has a massive secret Agent Clank collection. Meanwhile, Clank downloads a star map with coordinates to the planet Tyrannosis, so now we know where these freaks are coming from. After leaving Nefarious's office, you actually stumble your way into the Aquato sewers, which is Ratchet 3's crystal collection level like those found in Ratchet 2. I still really like this crystal hunt, even if it's a bit cramped, but the inclusion of being able to explore different tunnels with the help of the gravity boots, which you obtain later on, is awesome. And of course, what better place to run into our good old plumber pal again than in some stinky sewers. Whoa, deja vu. Ow! Oh, it's you two again. So with the info drawn from the star map, Quark draws up a plan to assault the Tyranoid's main enemy base, leading to one of my favorite bosses in the series up to this point. The Tyranoid Mother is again very easy, but the incredible music and atmosphere more than make up for it. When the duo made it back to the Phoenix to celebrate their victory with the team, Nefarious crashed the party to say some mean things, and afterwards the gang called on Al to figure out where the interference came from, and it turns out it had come from the planet Dax. The duo go to investigate the planet's weapons facility and find plans for Nefarious's mysterious bio-obliterator, and Clank also finds out that a transport ship had left Dax the day before, heading for the Obani moons. You also fight this mysterious warship out on the docks, which is really easy, but again, the music! I want to have sex to this soundtrack. Afterwards, Ratchet and Clank find a recently edited Courtney Gears music video. <laughs> You know, <laughs> the video they viewed was one of Courtney Gears expressing her support for Nefarious's desire to wipe out all organic life. The two got a chance to talk to her back at Annihilation Nation beforehand when they won this gizmo which was useful for infiltrating Nefarious's underwater base, but now that we know she seems to be in cahoots with Nefarious, the duo need to contact her again to try and figure out Nefarious's whereabouts. After winning some more arena challenges, she did indeed swear to provide that information if Clank could get her a role on his show. While filming for an episode of Secret Agent Clank, we fight this monstrous giant Clank and it fucking sucks again. You're supposed to beat up these ninjas before resuming the fight with this guy, but I just wouldn't let up and pummeled the poor fella. After the filming, Clank asks Courtney Gears for the information he needs, but she incapacitates him and he wakes up in Nefarious' office. Nefarious thinks that Secret Agent Clank is actually like a real thing, and he asks Clank to join him in his robot conquest of the galaxy, or else as he puts it, he'll make Clank follow the squishies into the black hole of oblivion. Ratchet then meets up with Clank, and he informs Ratchet that Nefarious is aboard a star cruiser called the Leviathan. Before leaving, the planet, the two receive a call from Skid who appears to have been captured after trying to help the duo out at the Obani moons. The two race back to the Obani Draco containing the testing laboratory, not lavatory this time, for the bio-obliterator and find footage of shit- shit- <laughs> and find footage of Skid shackled up by Courtney Gears. Whoa! Like I never knew you were this kinky, Miss Gears. When the laser fires, Skid is turned into a robot. Like, destroy all squishies. Dude. Courtney transports Ratchet to her music room, and we kick the shit out of her. At least she made a great fucking tune to kick her ass to. After defeating Gear, Sasha reported back with the location of the Leviathan Star Cruiser, and our heroes meet up with Quark and his monkey upon arrival. A really unfortunately timed arrival, by the way. <laughs> it was mating season. How could I have known she was your sister? Uh, <laughs> uh, how long have you two been standing there? Too long. It turns out Nefarious was using the Leviathan as a trap, triggered the self-destruct, and then teleported away. Lawrence. This isn't funny, Lawrence! 
Quark stayed behind, saying he saw something important in Nefarious' office. The two raced back to Quark's ship, but before Quark could get back to the vessel in time, Clank decided to prematurely flee the scene and left the Leviathan to crash to the planet below with Quark still aboard. Back at the Phoenix, the Q-Force decided to throw a funeral for Quark, and it's one of my favorite scenes in the whole series. Captain Quark had so many, um, uh, wonderful qualities, I just don't know where to begin. Such as? Oh, uh, okay, uh, he was really tall, and, uh, and he had a unique fashion sense, and he had a really big chin with a, kind of a sort of a, well, you know, a butt shape. Uh, uh, well, you know, I, I think I've droned on long enough. Clark's loss is a true tragedy. The man was a hero, brave, honest, kind, and humble to the core. <laughs> what a load of bullsh. At this point, I played through a few more Quark vid comics to get an idea of what Nefarious' next move could be now that we have no more leads. Through the comics, we learned that Quark was actually in Nefarious' ninth grade biology class and bullied him. Remember how he used to clean the chalkboard with your pants <laughs> while you were still wearing them? Oh, good times. You were three times my size, you stupid old. I was always big for my age. You were 26! Say, how about a wedgie for old time's sake? Quack! I think it's safe to say we've seen the last of Dr. Nefarious. Time to celebrate another job well done. Quark did in fact not see the last of Dr. Nefarious. Call the damn exterminator! Ah! So after battling our way through Nefarious' robotic insect army in Metropolis, we confront him in what is actually a pretty challenging fight, even though it definitely doesn't look it right now. But then he launches this ball of death at you, which can be pretty tricky to avoid since he's also coming after you. He then causes the ground to erupt with lasers, and towards the end of the fight, we'll couple that with this beam raining from above. This was honestly the most challenging Ratchet and Clank fight I've had probably since the optional Swamp Monster on Uzla. So as that comic told us, Quark foiled Nefarious' plans to conquer Kerwan. So that ends up being the team's next lead to check out as they believe Nefarious will return to take back the planet he never won. When Ratchet and Clank arrive at Metropolis, Nefarious was already there and ended up using the Bio-Obliterator to turn helpless citizens and his own tyranoid army into robots. After battling his way to a hovering train like the one in Ratchet 1, Ratchet finds Clank in a cage behind Nefarious. As it turns out, when Clank was sent to Nefarious, Nefarious kidnapped him and switched him with a fake known as Clunk. It was very obvious as they made it known something was up right away, but... You know, I wanted to hold off and make it suspenseful for you guys, I guess. So what does all this horse shit lead to? A horse shit boss fight! AGAIN! Yay! Once reunited with Clank, the two decide to head to the planet Zeldrin to investigate the Leviathan crash site and see if they could potentially find what Quark was looking for. It turns out they did indeed find what he was looking for, and they also found that Quark used an escape pod to flee the ship before its demise. However, the only trace of Quark left beyond that was a video of him calling for a cab and his footprints. When they brought the data disc back to the Phoenix, Al also gifted Ratchet with the secret fifth edition of the Quark vid comic series he found in Quark's headquarters. As we find out, after Quark defeated Nefarious in Metropolis, and left his head in a trash can, Lawrence ambushed him, leading to Quark being imprisoned in... Nefarious' secret prison. So this secret edition comic documented Quark's jailbreak and explained how Quark fled to a secret hideout on the Thran asteroid after escaping from Nefarious' clutches. Eventually, Quark came out of hiding thinking Nefarious had disappeared for good, and the rest is history. But coming so close to failing against Nefarious yet again, it was easy to suspect where Quark may have fled to after miraculously surviving the Star Cruiser crash. With that in mind, Ratchet and Clank flew to the asteroid belt to test their luck and see if they could find them. It turns out their hunch was correct as they confronted Quark and he explained how he abandoned the war against Nefarious for his own well-being, and Ratchet and Clank drop a bigger bomb on him than any bomb a weapon fired before this. You're pathetic, Quark. I can't believe I once looked up to you. Let's go, Clank. The people of this galaxy need you, Quark. They believe in you. You can give them hope. You have a chance to redeem yourself and become the hero you have always wanted to be. Once Ratchet and Clank were gearing up to leave the hideout, they got an emergency call from Sasha from the Phoenix under the attack of Nefarious' forces, who were clearly quite upset that the Q-Force was in possession of that data disc the two found at the crash site. So we go back to the Phoenix and rescue the team, and then head off to the planet Chorus to disable the bio-obliterator while it's charging. The two are successful in doing so, and then Sasha's like, JK lol, there's actually another bio-obliterator. 
<laughs> then we head off to the base of Nefarious' operations on the planet Mylon to take out that one. This final stage is very good, but for me personally, it's just not quite on the same level as Veldin and Yeedle. They were fucking great. What I'd say this level most definitely has an edge over Yeedle in at least is the final boss. I would say it's better than the fight against Drek, but the second half of the fight kind of sucks ass, which is a real shame. The fight begins dropping you from the Galactic Ranger battleship while evading the various rockets heading straight for you. Once on the ground, Nefarious utilizes the after image technique as well as fires lasers at you. After that, you- I am defeated. I have no choice but to throw myself on your mercy. Really? Uh, I mean, that's right, Nefarious. Your reign of terror is finally sucker! <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh... Anyway, so the fight really ramps up once you make your way out into this junkyard looking area filled with what seems to be giant clunk prototypes? I never noticed that before, that's really cool and creepy. But like I said, the action really ramps up here with Nefarious' robot army launching a frenzied assault at you while you've still got Nefarious himself to worry about with him firing laser beams from afar. And you know the music kicked ass here as well. Before pursuing Nefarious further, the Galactic Rangers actually show up to help, which I thought was a really nice touch as a way of repaying Ratchet for his help throughout this war, as well as them overcoming their cowardice since, well, it wasn't so much Ratchet helping, but more so doing everything, like I said earlier. Once you catch up with the Mad Doctor, he bombards you with missiles plummeting from above, throws nukes at you, spams more and more lasers and holograms all over the battlefield. This fight is nutty as hell. After his actual defeat, Nefarious calls in Lawrence, who is in the middle of a guitar session for assistance. Lawrence transforms the bio-obliterator into a giant mech, and just when all hope seems lost... <laughs> I gotta say, Quark swooping in here for the save is such a great cap to his character arc, finally becoming the hero he's always wanted to be again. He really is an amazing character. After this though, he just kind of flew around like, I did it, my brilliant plan, iron hard abs, woohoo! But yeah, for like the next 60 seconds, you're just shuffling to the right and shooting at Nefarious. It's a lot better than the Snivelock mech battle since at least I can't feel myself aging this time, but that's a horrendously unimpressive hurdle to overcome. Once Nefarious is defeated, he asks Lawrence to teleport them out of there before the mech self-destructs. And Lawrence teleports into some random asteroid floating through space because Nefarious didn't specify a location, he just said get us out of here. Nefarious asks to go somewhere else, but Lawrence says he can't do that because his teleportation isn't in range to go anywhere else, and won't be for around another five or ten thousand years. This was funny, but I can't help but be peeved because if you're so far out of range, how would you be in range to teleport to this asteroid in the first place? We also get a bunch of members of the Ratchet and Clank cast in a movie theater watching Secret Agent Clank, which was pretty cool. One of the more notable members of the crowd being Angela, who was entirely missing from this game and now Sasha and Ratchet are a thing. Ugh, I'm starting to get Jack 3 flashbacks. So would I consider Ratchet 3 Insomniac's greatest hit to this point? No. Ratchet and Clank started out as a gorgeous, enrapturing, galactic adventure, each world overflowing with atmosphere, accompanied by a colorful new character or characters to be found at nearly each new locale. While the combat was more demanding of strategy, it's safe to say the tedium of it, Ratchet's rigid mobility, and the kind of lackluster roster of weapons was a bit of a hindrance to the overall experience. Ratchet 2 swoops in to fix this issue, offering up much more destructive and powerful weapons to wield, while also granting a slick, fast-paced, acrobatic approach to combat, all the while still providing plenty of great characters and memorable worlds. Ratchet 3 comes in and... This is not to say what Ratchet 3 does is bad. Like its predecessors, it's a great, great game. It pretty much fully leans into the combat aspect of the series, and it pulls it off well enough, I guess. There's nothing inherently wrong with taking this direction and straying away from the exploration and new characters and whatnot. Me, personally? 
I just prefer the more atmospheric adventurous worlds of Ratchets 1 and 2 with a nice mix of slick combat, which is why out of the three, I tend to favor going commando. The lack of super captivating worlds begging to be investigated and plethora of characters aren't the only things holding up your arsenal back, however, as like I mentioned before, Nefarious' motives are trash, the Galactic Ranger missions kinda suck cause they just really feel like padding, which by the way, I should mention that this was the first Ratchet and Clank game to include multiplayer, so time spent developing that surely had to do with why things in single player could be lackluster. The online multiplayer servers were shut down in 2018 I believe, so that's a shame cause they looked kinda fun. I could play locally, but do I really care to? Another reason I bring this up though is because some of the Galactic Ranger missions in single player take place on these multiplayer maps, so... That's kinda lame. Ratchet 3 still has tons to offer though, as it's easily the slickest, most efficient gameplay experience of the trilogy. The music is amazing. I really appreciate the option to test weapons before purchasing them. The new weapon upgrade system is pretty cool. It helps you feel like you're constantly progressing and always have new toys to work with. Dr. Nefarious and Lawrence are hilarious together, and I'd personally say this is the funniest game of the three, thanks in part as well to the Quark Vid comics, which were also a blast. The expressiveness and animation also seems to have been taken up a notch, so that's a plus from this guy. So while it's not my favorite Ratchet and Clank game, I can totally see why it would be for many, and I would wholeheartedly recommend it to anyone. Seriously. It kicks ours. Final.